because I don't want to see another lost Latinx generation with their dreams and their passions being squashed. And I'm not asking for more. I just want what's mine. If we're 20% of the population and contributing $2.3 trillion to the GDP, and we have $1.3 trillion of buying power, and we're 25% of the U.S. box office, then I, I want what's mine. I don't want what's yours. I just want, for me, the youth, the Latinx generation, to get what they deserve. And, and hopefully, that's what's happening now. What's up, everybody? I'm Cristela Alonzo, and I am the first Latina to write, star, produce in their own network sitcom. I made TV history in 2014. Hi, I'm Stephanie Beatriz, best known for playing Rosa Diaz on Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I'll also be starring in In the Heights, which is premiering in 2021. What's up? I'm John Leguizamo, debuting my movie, Critical Thinking, the true story about five Latin and black kids from 1998 from the toughest town in Miami who became United States national chess champions. Hey everybody, I'm Benjamin Bratt. I'm an actor and a producer, and I'm like the dinosaur of the group. I've been doing this for 30 years, and uh, feels like yesterday. I'm Julio Torres, I'm a comedian and so-so actor. I have a show on HBO called The Spookies, and I've written for Saturday Night Live. And I'm Clayton Davis, Variety Film Awards editor. I identify as Black and Latino, and this is Represent Success Stories in honor of Hispanic Heritage Month, where we're celebrating our unique successes in Hollywood. To start off with, when was the first time you felt successful in your career? The first time I felt successful and that there was a possibility that, that a Latinx person could actually make it in this damn business, this Hollywood of it, was in 1990. I was only 12. <laughs> lying, lying, lying. I was, I was 26. And uh, I did the show Mambo Mouth. It was my first one-man show. So we choose odds. One, two, three. Psych. I lost. <laughs> I wrote it because I just kept getting put into these really negative roles that, that I felt that was contributing to the downgrade of Latinx image in, in the media. And so I wanted to write my own stuff so I could portray my people the way I saw them and felt them. The theater didn't really believe in me because they didn't put me in the theater. They put me in the hallway of the theater with 70 <laughs> fold-up seats and a foldable platform. And I had to be done by 8 p.m. when the real show started. But then the New York Times review came out by Frank Rich. And if Frank Rich wrote a good review about you, you were made. And all of a sudden, Sam Shepard, Arthur Miller, Al Pacino, John F. Kennedy Jr. were in the house. And all of a sudden, I felt like, oh my God, I have something to offer. I have something that white America, that black America, that Latin America wants. And, and somehow this this became the impetus for my, my whole life. I have the same answer. <laughs> 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 the way that John told that story, I'm like, I think that's my success story too. I'm like, all around, I want you to write a one man show about that answer right now. No, you show people that you love them by yelling at them and pointing out their every flaw. Yes, so that they can correct him and become better people. I grew up in a border town in South Texas, you know, like I'm first generation Mexican American. Spanish is my first language. When I fell in love with performing. I fell in love with theater. I fell in love with Broadway. I remember watching the Tony Awards and just thinking like, what is this? I want to be part of it. And it's funny, John, because you talk about that lack of representation in theater and not feeling welcome and stuff. And I never did either, you know? Like, it was funny because in my high school, we were predominantly Latino. And my freshman year, we did a production, I'm not, I'm not kidding, A Diary of Anne Frank, all <laughs> Latino. Right? And it was that thing where like my drama teacher said, you guys can do anything you want, whatever you want. If you want that part, you go get that part. And I left high school thinking, damn, I'm going to go get that part. And then I had a voice teacher at 18 that said, no, mija, look, you get, you get to do West Side Story and you get to do Chorus Line and then you're done. And that was the thing. Like for me, I was like, well, what do I do with it? And I got to tell you, when I started doing stand-up, I started doing stand-up like John because I wanted to write the words that I was going to say. I was mm -hmm. sick and tired of playing the maid. I was getting pinned for maid roles. And every time I went to every audition, the accent got thicker and thicker to where like, it just didn't become real. And I remember telling my agent, I would rather not audition at all. You know? Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, that's going to make it tougher. I'm like, I know, but it's going to feel better. So for me, the first time that I felt successful 
it was actually when I got the development deal for my show. We're finally on network television. That's right, Mexican <laughs> snuck on TV. Pow, pow, pow. It was that thing where it was like, I was creating my own world. I was actually getting to dominate like the world, the story, the narrative that I was telling, but also I was writing for other Latinos and I could actually control the authenticity that those characters were getting. And for me, coming from a border town to that, I mean, my mom wanted me to cut hair for a living. My mom used to always say, in a recession, people's hair grows. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to tell her, mommy, I like, mommy, if it works, it's gonna help all of us. But dating somebody white has its perks. You get better service. You only get a warning when you get pulled over. Also, you don't get pulled over. It's hard to say, right? Because I, I started my career in theater. I did a lot of regional theater. I was doing a lot of like American classics and Shakespeare. And, and I think the first time that I really felt like the powers that be at these regional theaters, and you know, we've, we've been discussing this all year long, but many of these regional theaters are heavily white. And it was when at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival that I was cast as Maggie the Cat in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. And I was like, oh, okay. They get me. They see the possibility. They see the world in which a woman that looks like this can also be that character. That was probably the first time that I thought to myself, like, maybe there's room for me and what I have to offer. Wait, are you crying? Yes. Thank you for acknowledging my feelings. Thank you for acknowledging mine. You know, I was the quintessential starving student in graduate school in my hometown, San Francisco. I was at ACT. I was driving the blue and yellow super shuttle van. You know, two 10-hour shifts a weekend, working at my cousin's photo engraving shop, 6.45 a.m. to 9.45 a.m., getting on a bike, getting up to class, putting on my ballet tights and, you know, doing the whole thing and then getting back home by 10 o'clock. My brother would make me dinner and we'd do it all over again. Even in those circumstances, I felt like I was already attaining some level of success because I was doing what I wanted to do. I was getting cast in, in classical theater roles, like, like Stephanie was saying. You know, I was flat broke. Um, but as soon as I left graduate school, work came pretty steadily. It wasn't really desired work, but it was work enough for me to be able to pay off my student loans. Mm -hmm. And then um, right after that, to pay off my mother's two uh, mortgages mm -hmm. on her house. So for me, that was the first real taste of material success where, you know, come from really humble background in San Francisco on welfare for a few years, to be able to take what I did something I was passionate about that I'd never been paid for before in my life and actually converted into something super positive um, that it had a direct effect on my family. That was my first real kind of defining success. But look how interesting. I mean, we all had opportunity all to be ourselves in the theater, mm. you know, First, because yeah. in movies and television, it was always so painful to be a drug dealer, like a, a killer, a rapist, or your gardener. <laughs> I only had those choices, but the theater had possibility, man. That's why Lin Manuel was able to do Hamilton. Because if he would have pitched that to a Hollywood studio or network or streamer, they would have been. Wait, excuse me, wait a minute. Burr's gonna be black. And Hamilton's <laughs> gonna be a Puerto Rican. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They did not speak in rap in the 1700s. <laughs> it would have never got done. But the theater. There are no gatekeepers, really, mm -hmm. especially on Broadway in the Manhattan, because it's more of an empty shell and you just have to raise the money and have the script and people dig it and you get a good review, you can survive. But, you know, if we have to wait for like executives to who don't look like us to believe that our stories are valid, that that we can play leads, cat in a hot tin roof, that we can have our own shows. Not so much. I feel the same, not with theater, but with stand up, which is like basically the same thing that you guys are saying. Just like, because I didn't know anyone who wasn't like TV or movies, and I like didn't want to spend any money on any classes. So I just like started doing open mics and like took it from there. And I, I mean, I, I use the word success very cautiously because I feel like I have that immigrant thing where I think I feel like <laughs> it can go away any second. <laughs> yes. Yeah, like vanishing. <laughs> yes. yes. No, uh, a really great moment was I had a stand-up special come out on HBO and it's a very experimental show. It's basically me holding up little objects and talking about the interior lives of different little objects. It's so good. 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 And in, it, I have, in it, I have this conveyor belt and I felt like one of my happiest moments was 
going to the warehouse where this conveyor belt was being made for this show. And I thought like, oh my God, how did I trick the executives <laughs> into green lighting this thing that no one's gonna watch, like four people are gonna watch, but I just like wear my like niche badge with pride. And I'm just like, great. I feel like I fooled enough people into like investing in my thing and that feels great. <laughs> 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 For this presentation that I have also made, their shadows and their souls. <laughs> Not crazy, I made them. I think this is very important to talk about. How did your peers and family members react to your successes? You know, I come from a Latin family, so, you know, it's el primo y la prima y la tía y la abuelita. Y, mm -hmm. So, you know, they were all like getting one big car and they come follow me around because kind of like everybody else, I did, you know, uh, performance art and stand up first because it was, you just go to open mic night, Monday at Catch a Rising Star or um, comic strip and you wait online for the lottery and your night name comes up. At midnight, you go on and you perform for five drunks in your family. <laughs> And then my parents are like, I your milk. What are we going to do with you? You, how, you playing to drunks? How are you going to make a living like that? And my father was like, you know, we didn't come to this country for you to be worse than us. And uh, and I was like, yo, but this is the dream. This is this is my dream. So they stopped coming as much <laughs> and following me around. And uh, my my mom and, and my aunt and my cousins and my and everybody, my brother would, would just follow me around to different performance art spaces and they fueled me, man. They supported me. They were my my cheering and uh, my squad. I thank them because without them, I, it would have been a little harder. But their support was so unconditional that even if people called me, you know, sometimes I would go up in Long Island, which is a strange place sometimes, and they'll go, "Hey, Richie Valens, hey, look at that, look at that. you know," they, <laughs> and worse, but and throw stuff at me, you know, bottles or whatever, empty drinks. But the family was, you know, was about to kick that. So I always felt I had somebody, somebody had my back. Mm -hmm. So that's what propelled me and continues to propel me was their, their, their enthusiasm for me. So my family still doesn't understand what I do. <laughs> like, my family has no idea. I remember my sister lives in Dallas. My two brothers still live in my hometown in South Texas. I had a show in Dallas years ago. I wasn't even headlining the show. I was middling for a comic and it was sold out. And my brothers, I remember after the set, I got off stage and my family was like, but like, why would they laugh at you? My family is funny. You know what I mean? So for me to actually make a living off of it, that really threw them off. When it comes to peers though, I'll tell you, it was interesting because I realized that in stand up, because I was never the comic that hung out after the sets, I would go do my sets, I would write, I would go home, I would work on my jokes. I never hung out. So. When I got my show, there was a group of comics that were like, where the hell did she come from? There were uh, other comics that were white, white male comic friends I had that would make these like snide remarks. Like they, I don't even know that they were aware that they were coming off so crappy, you know, but they're like, oh, well, I wish we had a family to exploit. But there's also groups that thought, oh, well, you took my chance. And that one's the weird one. When people think that you took their chance, it's like, but you're not Latina. Like, you know what I mean? You're not, you're not me. I didn't have a mentor. I had people I looked up to. But in this business, it's hard to find a mentor because a lot of us are, we're building the house while we're designing the blueprint, mm -hmm. right? So we're kind of figuring it out all on our own. And I'll tell you, I couldn't really celebrate when I got my show. I really can't celebrate when I get good things because it's a double-edged sword. The people that follow me on social media, they're really happy for me. But there's also people in the business that are not happy for me. You know, so it's that thing that I think that's why I really wanted to be part of this round table. Because I wanted people to know it's like, I respect everybody. And I think that we all have to understand that is that in this business, there is no right way to do it. It's that thing where with me, because I come from a blue collar family, my family, like, they don't understand that you can get paid for thinking, you know? So it's that thing where like my family doesn't fully get it. And then when you start getting things that maybe your friends didn't, at times you realize they weren't really friends. And that's the thing that, you know, I think that for me in certain circles, my circles has, have gotten smaller 
the more I'm into this business, you know? And that's something that I struggle with. But when I find people that I click with, they're with me forever. When you are a, a big deal lawyer, you will be embarrassed by me. What? Don't be ridiculous. I'm already embarrassed by you. This is very cool for me because like all of the people that are speaking right now in this round table, I dearly wish we could all be in the same room because it, it would make me feel even happier. But this is really cool for me because each of you have in one way or another, and like Chriselle said, in very different ways, highly influenced how I look at the art that I'm trying to make in the world from the time that I was like 16 and reading Mama Mouth for the first time and then to now I'm watching Julio's special. It's like the breadth of the work that has happened across the board here is really remarkable and it's all so different. I think the first thing that has to happen is that you know, we have to collectively understand that black storytellers and black stories are vitally important. Once that sort of shifts and we see black stories being told and celebrated and sort of winning the awards that they deserve, I think then like everything else follows after that because the discrepancy is so large. It used to happen more than it does now is like, snide comments by people like Christella was saying or like I remember meeting a bunch of women at a lunch once and I didn't know very many of them and one of the women at the lunch asked me about Brooklyn Nine-Nine and getting cast on it I told her you know I, I'm nervous I don't know if the show is gonna get picked up we just shot the pilot and she said I auditioned for that show but they did tell me they were gonna go ethnic and I thought and at the time I was too young to really I was too young and dumb to have like a smart answer right back to her. But I think about that all the time because to say like, oh, I heard they were going ethnic. Sure, there are shows that choose their cast based on how they can model the diversity of the real world. But also there are some shows that choose their cast. My character in particular was written for a white person, it was written to be a redheaded, hot-headed Irish cop. And I came in and I did something different and they rewrote the part for me. So I just think like it's all it's all catching up. Like we, we know where we want to go. It's just everybody just has to catch up with us. Ow! Oops. I think peers and family members are, are, are well-meaning when they ask a question like this. Hey, do you feel like you've made it? Or when they make a statement that, hey, you've made it because it helps us as artists who are already thinking that way to confirm that that's the way to think about this approach to life in the arts. And of course, it's not the way at all, but I, I wanna share a story with you in the late 90s when I felt like I stepped off a platform and made it, or you arrive. And it's an illusion. I was on Law & Order, there were no streamers at the time. We won an Emmy for best drama on television. You know, movie parts were starting to come and I went out to one of these large events, I think it was the Golden Globes, and I had a conversation with Ken Ehrlich, who was a longtime producer of these events backstage. And he said, hey kid, you're from San Francisco, right? And I said, yeah, actually I am. Because well, one of my best friends worked there for years on a show called Streets of San Francisco. I said, are you friends with Carl Malden? And he said, yeah, Carl Malden. I said, Carl Malden from On the Waterfront, from, you know, Streetcar Named Desire. I love Carl Malden. So I told him this story of when I was a kid when Streets of San Francisco was shooting in my neighborhood. And I waited outside that practical location for about an hour for Carl to come out. And when he emerged, I said, hey, Carl, Mr. Marlin, Mr. Marlin, can I get your autograph? He said, sure, kid. He blew right by me, got in the Ford LTD and drove off. Cut to a year later, I'm at the same event and I run into that producer again. And he goes, hey, Benjamin, I wanna, I wanna let you know something. I ran into Carl and I, I shared, the story you shared with me last year about how when you were a kid and he blew you off when you asked him for an autograph. He said, oh yeah, what was his reply? He said, who the f is Benjamin Bratt? <laughs> <laughs> so in that anecdote is something how I approach my career now, which is you can't, you can't assume that you can stop the grind. Like I've been doing this for more than 30 years, like I said, but I'm still in the grind, man. Like I never really feel like I have arrived and I have a set place that I can rely upon. I trust my skills, I trust my intelligence, I trust my, my artistry, but I don't trust the people who are in the position of making the decision of whether or not mm. to do the job. So much like John, much like Cristela, much like Julio, I recognized uh, thankfully a while back that you must take on that authorship for yourself. 
because no one else is gonna tell those stories that you know that are dear and near to your heart for you. So that's where I'm coming from these days and the thing I'm most excited about is teaming up with my brother Peter, who's a writer and a director, and taking on those stories ourselves. And like it's already been acknowledged, a lot of the walls that have been standing for a long, long time are finally starting to crumble. People with the deciding power are finally waking up and going, oh, these Latinos, they, 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 they can tell a good story, you know? Uh, and it's disturbing because for, for all of our lives, all of us here on this panel have, have recognized that there's this a specific kind of exoticizing that goes on when, when the dominant culture looks at us. We're still the mysterious other, you know, almost something to be feared or, you know, as the encroaching menace or however you want to put it. And it's not the case, you know. Latino culture has been here before this was the United States. We're a cornerstone of what this country is and that's never really been acknowledged and we've never really been accepted in pop culture in a way that truly recognizes that. And I know that that for myself and my brother, just as with everyone else here on this panel, that's part of our personal mission. By the way, Benjamin and his brother have a great oh, yeah. documentary. Oh, yeah. I love that documentary. I watch it all the time. I went to the screenings. I interviewed her. I can't recommend it higher. Like the storytelling, everything. Everybody should see this one because it's a perfect example of what Benjamin is saying about telling the stories in a way that really makes you just think and learn and just be entertained about someone, a story that doesn't get enough attention, which is like the life of Dolores Huerta. That's I just want to say that because it's so good. Much, much appreciated, Cristela. That's that's a really nice thing to say. But that's a, it's a perfect case in point that Dolores Huerta mm -hmm. is an American woman who lived, born and raised- An in American the icon yet never felt that she belonged. And yep. she changed through legislation, through her civil rights work, changed life for everybody, not just Latinos, but you know, uh, authored legislation that, that affects everyone in our lives today. The narrative is that we just got here. We didn't mm -hmm. just get here. We discovered America, which was ourselves, because we're mostly indigenous and black. And then we built it, we founded it. It was taken from us by the British and then the Americans took the Southwest. But we've been here since then. We're the only ethnic group that's fought in every single war America's ever had. And the most awarded. I mean, those are incredible contributions. Even Sylvia Mendes in the 1940s. She was a pioneer because her kids were being segregated in LA, but she wanted to go where they had the supplies and the better education. So she went to the Supreme Court and fought for desegregation before Brown versus Board of Ed. So she paved the way. Why isn't that a movie? Why isn't that in our history textbooks? There are so many great Latin stories and heroes from the American Revolution, Civil War, World War One, World War Two. It's, we invented the color TV. <laughs> Where is that story? We invented hand sanitizer too, which is very important in 2020. <laughs> yes, we did. Yes, we did. <laughs> no, like the pen yeah. and the yo-yo. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but what's amazing about about Johnny Legs is that he's obviously impassioned about this. This is a direct has a direct impact on his life as a man and as an artist. I was working with a, uh, uh, with him on a film in Miami uh, when he was workshopping what became yeah. the Morons. Those who cannot remember their past are doomed to repeat it. Coño. The guy is a machine. Like he's working, working, working. It's an issue that is near and dear to his heart um and it has an educational component yeah, well, i work like that because i'm an immigrant and i got the immigrant <laughs> work ethic that you got you, you can't stop working you even when you sleep you're you're working somehow you know <laughs> you wake up oh that's what I <laughs> yeah i gotta do more i gotta do more i'm not doing enough i'm not trying mm -hmm. hard. that's why john's wearing a cap because it looks like he can like offer you a loan but also coach a baseball game <laughs> <laughs> yo we gotta do four or five jobs look at j-lo <laughs> Jalen can't just act, she has to dance, sing, mm -hmm. sell clothes, perfumes, yo. I feel like I, I really lucked out because my mom was always super encouraging. I was always very secretive of sort of about like what I wanted to do because it just, I don't know if you guys feel this thing of just like, oh, I don't want to tell people I want to be a comedian. That's mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. how humiliating <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to, to, to admit that. I feel like she always felt that I was going to make it in whatever definition, which is something that I'm, I'm still defining. But I, I remember taking my first writing job for like a variety special in LA and uh, getting on a lift 
to go to like the Western Union for the first time and send money back home. And having that like little interaction with the Lyft driver who's like also like does it constantly. And having that be like, I am now finally in a very tangible uh, way, sort of like beginning to to get back. And that felt right. like, okay, like now, now we're now we're going somewhere. You know, now I'm not I'm no longer just like taking, 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 taking as a child, but I'm just like starting to do uh, my part. What does success mean for the Latinx community? in Hollywood moving forward. I'm a little older than Ben, I think. So I've been in the industry for 35 years. You got me. You know, trying to make it in the acting business, but then trying to write and going to studios and and pitching them ideas and you come in there full of passion and, and we'll do the story about this. And they're like, well, you know, Latin people don't want to see Latin people. And I was like, what? Is that true? It makes you question yourself. You're like, do I really not want to see people who look like me? Do I really not want to hear our stories? And I would go home and be bugged out and I'll be like, maybe my people don't, don't maybe, maybe we're that self-hating that we don't want to see each other. We just want to see white people all over the place. And then I would pitch more stories and the executive would say, oh, too bad you're Puerto Rican because you're so talented, you'd be such a bigger star. And they wouldn't get done another project. Then the movie I just did, I pitched it around the studios and they would go, you know, Latin people don't want to see feel good movies, which is the craziest thing to say to me. I almost lost my mind. So I had to raise my, the money independently to get the movie done. So that's part of the struggle is these gatekeepers who don't get it, don't get us, don't really care. But because of COVID, because of Black Lives Matter, because there's a reckoning happening in America right now, things are really changing. Look at what the Oscars just did, man. The Oscars are asking for a certain amount of people of color in front of the camera, behind the camera, if they're going to submit their movies. That's a huge step, man. And a beautiful step for the Latinx generation because I don't want to see another lost Latinx generation with their dreams and their passions being squashed. And I'm not asking for more. I just want what's mine. If we're 20% of the population and contributing $2.3 trillion to the GDP and we have $1.3 trillion of buying power and we're 25% of the U.S. box office, then I, I want what's mine. I don't want what's yours. I just want for me, the youth, the Latinx generation to get what they deserve. And and hopefully that's what's happening now, thanks to COVID in a weird way. And definitely thank you to Black Lives Matter, because then they start to see that Latin lives matter too, you know. In order to have more success in the Latino community, we have to do a couple things. First of all, we have to acknowledge what has happened in the past. I don't think that we put enough attention into the past and celebrate what has happened. This panel is so perfect in that example because I got to tell you, John, you talk about Mambo Mouth and I remember like cable TV was my only outlet to anything. <laughs> and I remember like I used to watch those shows and I waited for it to be released because it mattered so much to me. And because wow. I saw your show, it made me feel like I could write my own. Good, good, good. But, but, it's that, but it's that thing where it's like, you weren't trying to do that. You were trying to write your show. It made me want to tell my own story. Julio, you've been in this country for 10 years. What you have accomplished in those 10 years <laughs> is amazing. You know, and also you come from stand up. You're a Latino, but you're not the idea of what people think a Latino comedian is. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, you're the same way the character in Brooklyn Nine Nine. Like, you are someone that, like, years ago, you know, they would have tried to use tropes and everything. When you told your answer at the beginning, where you're talking about doing regional theater and stuff, there was a part of me that was really jealous <laughs> that you have to do regional theater because, like, for me, I didn't have that chance. Mm -hmm. Law and Order. Benjamin, the fact that there was a brown person on the show, <laughs> yeah. like, because let me tell you, even if it was in New York, it was a big deal that there were brown people yeah. on TV in a New York <laughs> show, you know? So for me, what we have to do is we have to make a point to celebrate what we've accomplished and how we accomplish it and how we do it in our own authentic way. But in order for this community to succeed, we need to get people everywhere. In 2014, my show was on ABC. There were no Latino executives or anybody at that network that worked with it. So I had to fight with them all the time to explain my existence to them. If my existence, if my story didn't fit their version of what Latino life is, it was inauthentic to them. But here's the thing. My year that I had the show, Blackish and Fresh Off the Boat were both new shows. 
my show was the only one that was canceled. And you know what I found out the next year? Two Asian executives were in charge of Fresh Off the Boat and they understood the story, the culture, everything that was being told because it was familiar to them. Same thing with Blackish. I didn't have the luxury of having a gatekeeper that would fight for me. Mm -hmm. I had to fight against them myself. So when we talk about representation mattering, we always talk about the people on the camera. And yeah, that's fine because it, we, we see the people on the camera, but I need people that are directors, I need producers, I need the executives, I need the writers, I I need the stage managers to be Latino, like I need everything because that is just representative of who we are. You know, it's, like, you know, it's so the real world. It's the exactly. real world, you know, so, how America is. So yeah. for me, that is how we get success. We get success by understanding our past, where we came from. We're doing this round table for Hispanic Heritage Month. And I gotta tell you, just from all the answers I've seen and just the interaction with everybody, I'm so glad to be part of this because we need more conversations like this where yes, we actually lift each other and acknowledge each other mm -hmm. and what we're trying to do. We need more of that. Officer Deetmore, I came down here to say I'm sorry. Oh, good, go ahead. No, that was it, I did it, I said I'm sorry. Hey, I said it again. Now I got one in the bank so I can do whatever I want to. It's so silly to think that we don't want to see ourselves because human beings are just drawn to good storytelling. So what's exciting to me about what I think is happening and what will continue to happen is that we're going to see more of each other and different kinds of Latinos on screen, big and small. And that's not going to go away anytime soon. That to me is a success. When, when someday if I have a family and I have a kid that looks like me, that she won't ever be searching and scrolling or, you know, like I did watching Sesame Street until I was 13 years old because those were the Latinos that I knew <laughs> on TV, you know? Benjamin, the funny story about you was, weirdest fact about me is I love Sandra Bullock and I'll be in love with her till I die. You gave me hope that I could marry her one day because I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, it can happen. I, I, I can date her. Like, like these are the things that we look for. The reality is, I'm I'm incredibly encouraged by the undeniable fact that as a as a culture, we're nearly at a point of critical mass. Mm -hmm. Like the Latino culture by 2050 is going to be the majority, um, and in the wake <laughs> of that transformation that's occurring right now. We have young artists behind us, and Julio's a perfect example of this, who is Latino to the bone, and yet his work is just beautiful, ingenious, funny work. And he is who he is. And he reminds me of my sobrinos, who they're not interested in assimilating. It, they're not about assimilation. They know they're, they're Americano puro, and they're also equally proud of their cultural heritage, and those two things marry together represent who they are. So as long as that duality exists and artists keep being artists and telling good stories, because that's ultimately something we all agree on is that you have to tell a good story. You have to entertain people. It has to be good, right? It has to be good. Then I think the barriers that have been knocked down by generations before us, and I, I include John as a pioneer uh, and Cristela as well. Uh, and there were many that came before us that did a lot of the hard work. The road has gotten a little smoother as a result of that. And I'm encouraged by the young people behind us who are, who are passionate about the arts, passionate about their, their cultural representation, and not worried so much about, to use a, a, a turn of phrase that Eva Longoria was favored to use, hitting people over the head with a tortilla. It's not necessary. <laughs> you know, just be who you are and be good. And people will come, and I, and I really believe that. Julio, closing us out strong. Let's go. I was just thinking how it's very telling that Hispanic Heritage Month runs mid-September to mid-October. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that it's like, there's so much, like, from the outside, there's so much grappling with, like, what does the Latino audience, what does the Latino audience want? And it's just like, well, it's such a colossal mm -hmm. group of people, and it's just so gigantic, and it's like, the life experience of, like, an Afro-Latino from the Caribbean is going to be so different than, like, you know, a blue-eyed Argentinian. It's it's just so, like, crazy that we keep trying to, like, stretch that term as far as it can go. And it's like, you see it in politics, too, where they're, like, going crazy. It's like, well, what do Latinos want? What do Latinos want? And I feel like they keep, like, the gatekeepers, like, to come to a a Latinx artist and be like, well, are you the answer? <laughs> are you, are you, do you have the thing that they like? And it's like, well, I have the thing that I am. And, you know, that will speak to some people, but 
probably not to like a whole continent worth of people. And then in terms of thinking of like, what does success mean to the community? I, I think that sort of seconding what Grisela was saying that representation is sort of chapter one. Okay, so first we want to see people that look like their audiences, right? And then we want to see people behind the camera that are like making the decisions to make sure that those stories are authentic. But then I feel like an increasing growing elephant in the room in Hollywood is like, where does that money go? Just being like, okay, so who are the parent companies that own us? And then what are they doing to that money? And how do we make sure that our contributions are helping our audiences and not just like widening the wealth gap, which is just sort of like an existential little question that I asked myself when I was like, wait, HBO is owned by AT&T. Am I an employee of AT&T? And what, and, and what does that mean for my community? You know, starting to ask these big questions of like, thank you for giving me a show, thank you for giving me a platform. Now, how do I, using these things that you've given me, try to make it a, a world that not only appears to be more fair because the people on screen look like us, but like, how are we actually contributing to the, the world being a little more fair? And not just for the people that look exactly like us, but for anyone who might be underrepresented or like being punched down. All right, on that note, uh, I just want to say thank you so much for being part of our Represent Success Stories today and celebrating all your successes with us. You have all helped pave the way for our community and we look forward to everything you're going to bring in the future. Yeah, right. nice meeting you. Great being on the panel with all you. Yeah, Great thank you so much. Bye, everybody. That was amazing. Bye.